Um, thank you so much for having us here. And the first thing I want to say is that we have a really, really, really diverse panel from leaders in the smartphone space, the PC space, and the auto space out here to talk about a great topic. Uh, but before we de jump in, I wanted to start with a small story. So how many of you have heard of the name Michelin for tires? Yeah. How many of you know that Michelin tires and Michelin star is related? Wow. So um, the story goes that in the late 1800s, there weren't enough cars. And the two uh, individuals who started Michelin tires actually started a small magazine to tell people in Paris about the nearest stops where they could go and have good food, where there were good mechanics, where there were good gas stations, because remember in the late 1800s, Google and Google Maps did not exist, right? Obviously. And uh, gradually they wanted to actually uh, tell people that this is a genuinely good place and that was the birth of Michelin star. So who could have ever thought that a company that actually made tires would tell you which is the best restaurant to eat food in, right? So before we get into the seriousness of brand trust, I just want our panelists to tell us that if they could make a decision to enter a completely different business with their brand, like Michelin went from tires to restaurants, what would you envision it to be? like a new space to jump into. Like I'm sure HP started with calculators and PCs and is today leading AI innovations, right? So, so where would you see a new industry where you would like to make a mark? I think from a Vivo perspective, uh, I'll prefer automobile as a personal interest, given that uh, the level of innovation which is possible in that particular sector is a different level. Uh, sorry, MG, I mean. <laughs> Competition right here. I yeah, know. I think uh, since you talked about brands really diversifying and we're talking about brand trust, I think one place where you really need the trust to come through is the kids segment. So I think if I wanted to <laughs> get HP to get into something unrelated, it'd be about kids. Yeah. Okay. A great, great. That's a great answer. And for MG. So MG, um, you know, we've been a pioneer in innovation and in breaking land speed records, and you know, innovation has been a core centricity. We call ourselves as an auto tech brand. So the alternative path would be a tech company, you know, and how we are working as a tech company to solve consumer problems. So it's not like it's a food, uh, it's a particular area, but how you can embrace tech to solve consumer problems, that would be one area that MG can pioneer uh, in solving specific use cases. Absolutely. I, I think great industries to uh, get into. Auto, of course, close to my heart as well. Um, now, coming back to the topic at hand, um, there's a very interesting quote which reads that trust takes years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. And, uh, you know, all these brands that we have here today are very, very, very uh, legacy brands with a lot of trust. So can you shed light on the steps uh, it takes not only to build trust with a new audience, but to maintain it with your core audience that's been with you through the years? Um, you can pick it up as it goes. Questions open to the floor. Yeah. Um, so it's great that you, you know, you mentioned the quote because honestly, I don't think trust is something which is about one activity, one minute, one day. Uh, it's about coming through at every interaction with your customer. And it's exactly like a relationship, right? You do one thing wrong and the trust breaks, yeah. Uh, nobody remembers the hundred things you do well, by the way, right? Everybody remembers the one thing, the one day you didn't come through, the one call you didn't pick up. Uh, so, so for brands, it's exactly the same thing. Um, and that's why I feel, uh, so I mean, trust isn't about doing well one activity. I think it starts and finishes through every part of the funnel. And because I know this audience is uh, marketing heavy and you know a lot of marketers would want to really see this come alive. Uh, see, when I communicate at an upper funnel level with my customer, the idea is to be honest, right? When I make claims, are they corroborated? Are they true? Or is everything hidden in my disclaimers and my fine print, right? That's the first point where people are forming their perception of brand uh, trust, you know. Today, our consumers are disbelieving, right? People actually go and say, you know, you tell them you have a promotion running, they'll say, ye ek hi unit pe hoga. Two, two stores mein milega. On this particular model, on this color, for the first 50. I mean, it's a big shiny ad, it's like, oh my God, they're running such a great promotion, and then he realizes, 
you're just fooling him or her, right? Um, I think that's where you start losing brand trust and people lose that for brands overall because there are certain compulsions of say the competition space and everybody tells us, no, no, you must talk the same way. We must look as shiny, as good. Um, but that's when we start cheating our consumers. So, you know, I think the first mark of a good trustworthy brand is when you're not misleading your consumer, right? Um, when the consumer goes down into the research and evaluation uh, uh, phase, you know, I think people have started trusting a lot more of people like themselves versus big names. You know, again, those brands have lost their trust because they've sold everything for money, right? So, so the customer says, everyone can be paid money. You know, they're reading all the influencer stories. So they're saying, must have paid, right? Must have given money. So that's why they're talking such great things, right? Um, so it's, it's a lot more about getting evangelists from within your customers. And when somebody is buying, it's really the ability of your network to be there. Because what is the customer looking for? Can I come back to hold someone responsible? Yeah, which means does after sales service show up, right? Because that's when they'll go and tell another 100 people uh, that this is a great brand, right? And that's when you'll really, when you go and ask, you know. In fact, you'll realize brand trust is one of those metrics if you measure it through your brand researches. While it moves with communication, it will fall exactly the same way if the other points don't come through, right? Uh, so while you might, while there may be ways to move it through communication, through research and evaluation, if you don't stand by it at the points in the moments of truth, um, it will never really stay for you. So therefore, brands who built it uh, have built it across various points, right? And, and for a brand like HP, you know, 700 stores, 24-7 um, support, post, post sales. Um, you know, having those channels where people can come back to you, uh, besides what comms does, besides what comms says, and the fact that what it says is also honest, clear, um, you know, and not misleading, I think all of those things really create brand trust for you and maintain it over a period of time. Yeah. Mayank, what about you from a Vivo perspective? I think I 100% uh, agree with Shivani, given that uh, the trust is something which just can't be built a day or a moment. I think it takes a long, long time to do and you have to deliver each and every time. See for Vivo, it's, we are celebrating 10 years in India, right? And coming from a background which is being backed by China, it was always difficult to get into a trust issue out there. But I think we did a wonderful job given that the 10 years of celebration in terms of we are celebrating to be the highest market share for past three consecutive quarters. I think that's what we take at the back of us. Secondly, also in terms of trust, when it talks about it's any communications from a brand angle or from a brand uh, person putting any moment, any comment, any idea behind, it should be very well be acknowledged by the brand. And hence, we believe a lot in our after sales also. So given that, we might have a lot of retails marketing happening into it. But from a service point of view, each and every service center is directly owned by Vivo. So that's why we say, OK, TK, there is one, you buy. Second is, we is there to, if there is a problem because that comes as a habit. It, it's a responsibility if I give you a product to give you a genuine service is my responsibility. And accordingly, when you are buying a product, trust me, we have some 35,000 people standing on stores. We talk on our behalf and say, okay, this is the product. And they claim, okay, if this is the component and this is the configuration, this is the price, it has come directly from the brand. And that's how they started keeping trust on that. And as it said, it's not taken over a time. It takes 10 years for us. The kind of relationship which we have built with retailers, with those 35,000 people standing on the shop, and the million of people who are associated with the 35,000 people is just because of the trust which we have earned over the time. So hence, I think it's every moment, then you have to prove yourself as a trust part to it. Yeah. Udit, for you, I mean, buying a car is more of a family decision than, you know, buying a phone for yourself or a laptop for yourself. So it's more family trust. No, so I'll, I'll first start with the basics. So we are not a 20-year-old, 30-year-old brand in India. So MG started its operations in 2019. We started selling cars officially in 2019. Uh, like Mayank said, we had a baggage of Chinese origin, but we've been doing a great job in terms of reinforcing our origin of Britain, which is Abingdon, Oxfordshire. So how do we build trust with that is one of the key, you know, key responsibilities that we had during the launch of MG brand and MG Hector in India. But coming back to the fundamentals, you know, 
excluding the comms. Automotive is a fairly fragile space if the product experience is bad. And you know, if you're stuck on the road, if you are, you know, not being taken care of, when you look at the brand tracks, the most important source of awareness is not TV, billboards, digital. It's word of mouth. Your maximum car sales are coming from reference. So the leading principle, in my opinion, while we are formulating the brand remains how you are being authentic to the customer in your communication. So authenticity is one of the key factors in each and every piece of communication. And I'll cite this with an, with an example shortly. The second part is listening and response management plays a very, very key role. And it is not about a ORM command center who's sending you a robotic response saying that we'll get back to you in 10 minutes. How you are building functions in after sales and in a quick response manner where if a customer is stuck on road on RSA, how are you taking care of that customer? If there is a breakdown ap happening, are you giving a you know, a complimentary car service during uh, that period. So while core objective is to sell a car, but the driving experience is driven through authenticity, after sales is a key role, but the listening and response management part from an after sales perspective is really important. The last thing is when we look at car buying, it is still the second most aspirational purchase in the country and a normal churn happens every five years. So if nowadays within three to five years you are switching the car, if your product is not delivering, if your staff is not trained, if you are not authentic to the customer, even in let's say repair bills, even in service costs, that brand trust diminishes within the third to fifth year and you will not get a repeat purchase uh, in the life cycle of the product. One example that I would like to cite here is with our recent Windsor launch where we introduced battery as a service uh, model where you know, you're not paying for the battery and you're paying battery rental. Every person from the media asked us, kuch to catch hai, aap to kuch to hide kar rahe ho. So we went down to the extent of educating everybody that there is no catch. You know, there is no uh, cap on kilometers. You can even buy a BAS program at zero kilometer plan as well. So there were a lot of doubts. Windsor is just launched. We just started deliveries on this era. So everybody in the, in the industry said, you know, there's a catch. Kuch to chupa hoga. You know, competition was saying, no, sir, this is, you know, you're, you're paying actually more. But for use cases which were smaller of 500 kilometer run, 750 kilometer run, they were actually appreciating BAS as a product. So we went down to the extent of educating everybody saying that there is no catch. You can buy it at even a zero kilometer use plan and there is no capping that is there. So I think training, being authentic and continuing to listening to your customers is building brand trust, it's a pervasive function and it doesn't end in one day or it is not one iota of activity that will define trust for your brand. Absolutely. I, I, I think that from the brand's perspective, there's a lot happening, right, with uh, the way you're putting a customer-first approach or having a very well-trained staff or having 24-7 support for PCs if it breaks down in the night and you're working on a US shift. But communication of that trust has changed. I mean, uh, maybe a few decades ago, you would read about all this information in a trusted publication or it would come on their online version. Gradually, we shifted to television. We've now come online and now we have, we are surrounded by leaks and rumors and a lot of misinformation. So how do you use the current crop of communication channels to, you know, build trust with your existing audience and try to get new audiences into your pool? We can start from here this time. So, um, first of all, um, leaks, because you started with that. Um, I think in automotive, it is, um, no matter how much we try, uh, leaks are bound to happen because the bro product is being tested on the road, whether for government certification, whether for ICAT, whether for ARAI, whether for, you know, validation of the product across different terrains and features. So, in our case, most of the leaks are authentic. But whether that product will be validated or launched in India is subjective where the media speculation comes into the foray. Specific to automotive industry, 
uh, 70 to 80 percent of the product discovery has already happened online. Uh, and in our observation over the last five years, the new age creators are playing a big role. Uh, uh, you know, like Shalini, uh, Shivani said, that from the authenticity perspective, looking for people like me. Uh, a 20 year old who's recommending the car to the father may not know uh, an overdrive or an auto car, but he may know an ask car guru who he is following for, let's say, authenticity. So, there, in our touch points of content, while there is awareness and familiarity coming from, let's say, mainstream mediums like print, television, CTV, uh, and even the recency factor coming from always on digital, I think influencer marketing from a product recommendation perspective plays a very key role in automotive. Uh, and thereby, the real consumption that we feel is happening through the media reviews. How do you sustain that conversation post a media drive, post the product initial phase is over? I think continues to be the pervasive pro uh, you know, process when it comes to the mix perspective. Because my uh, humble submission is you cannot be always on on ATL. But with the rise of the creator economy, there is a substantial frugal innovation that you can do and leverage it on a pervasive basis. I'm sure Shivani and uh, my uncle first say stop covering our leaks on 91, but, <laughs> but I'll let you take the floor for the control of information. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I think um, completely agree with Udit on the fact that you can't be, you know, everywhere at all points in time. So, you know, just picking up from that, um, and, and probably my uncle would agree, like, at least on the tech side, Samir, we call it the messy middle, okay? <laughs> um, the, the consumer is spending four to six weeks researching and evaluating. Um, therefore, the touch points are so many uh, that it's impossible for any brand to cover those, right? Um, I think, therefore, one thing which is very important, which is beyond the, uh, you know, the media discussion or the content discussion is that brand builds enough trust for your recommendations to have merit, right? Uh, for the buying to be so easy, so decoded that the customer is able to say, oh, you know, they'll guide me right. Um, however, the times that we live in, even if I say a hundred times and I go out in the most credible media and say, you know, I've got the best recommendation engine, the conflict of interest reduces the believability, right? No consumer wants to listen to the same brand saying, I'm going to tell you the best, but like, you've got to sell me your product. You'll never tell me someone else has a better product. Fair enough, right? Um, and that's why I think who you have to choose lies as a juxtaposition of your brand values and of your consumer's trust. Right? And, and their engagement with that consumer. Right? Um, the consumer trusts you and that's why you're a good legacy brand. Uh, but because you survive in an industry, they want an impartial view. Right? In that, now today you need to rank. Right? We found UGC have a lot of value. We find communities having a lot of value. Uh, then maybe there's credible tech publishers like yourself. Right? And then there's influencers. Right? Because that's the order in which they see uh, money having a value uh, for these people, right? Uh, therefore, you've got to see who your consumer is trusting. Um, within that space, who are the people who can evangelize your brand in the right way, right? Like if I'm looking to sell a gaming laptop, um, I should talk to somebody who has gaming credibility, who's a gamer, who's in gaming communities, who's seen there, who's heard there, respected there, and has engagement with that. So it just isn't a function of reach, right? So if somebody comes to me and says, this guy has 25 million followers, but has no hold with my consumer set, then he has no value for me. He or she has no value for me. And I think the idea is to ensure that the people that you are trusting with that can drive the metric you're looking for. Because you're looking at also response. You're not looking at just how many people here, but how many quality people here. So sometimes it's important to go after those niches and not really go after mass because, you know, they'll drive reach. Yeah. So I think you really have to drive it from the objective of your brand who you want to talk to, and who has the trust of those people that you really want to talk to, um, where, you know, they can drive mileage for you. So I think that for me then is the order basis, UGC, community, publisher, uh, this thing. But yeah, the messy middle will remain to be yeah. solved, right? I think phones have it the messiest with leaks going on throughout the years, man. How, how do you deal with that? First, I think because Shivani said I have to second, so I will second her. <laughs> <laughs> That's part one. But yes, you rightly said, given that uh, 
leaks are the biggest thing for the mobile part and uh, as because uh, Shivani also said in terms of you know what your consumer follows right so from a from an experience point of view you should know in terms of which all partners are you getting associated with are leaks part of the plan yes leaks are part of the plan but leaks to the people whom your consumers are following into see if there is a miscommunication in leaks also it gives you a bad imagery for the brand and for the tech publisher or for any other partner giving that right so it's better to channelize those why because your consumer is looking for those particular leaks so it's better to be a part of the plan Similarly, for KOL perspective also, one is definitely there are like heavyweight lifters who have the fan followings and sorry to say we, being a marketer point of view because of reach and XYZ things, we have to go and collaborate. But at the same time, there are actual consumers. See, if from a Vivo point of view, we build on our camera, right? We have a Zeiss partnership wherein we build, okay, our camera is totally out of the world and it's actually give the DSLR type of images. So it's either two options we do, we as a brand and say, oh, here's the camera, here's the output. Or here there are few people amongst you, among the consumers who capture those images and they have a notification which says, or maybe a photo holder which says, shot by Mayank on his X100. And that comes the value. Wherein consumers say, oh, this is something captured by a normal human being, a normal ecosystem, and hence is being captured by the device. So if you are able to channelize all the communications which build more trust and more authenticity in terms of what is being communicated, the consumer is fault to trust on those. Consumer will believe, yes, this is happening and this is true. And hence, let me follow the brand. So, uh, I mean, for cars, Henry Ford said any color will do so long as it's black. But uh, in, in the field of innovation, he said, if I asked my audience what I wanted, they'd say faster horses. Um, so keeping that in mind, I mean, all, all the brands we have out here today have some great innovation from battery as a service to the partnership with Zeiss for cameras and even the foldables that are so great to AI PCs making people's lives just so much more simple. How do you communicate that innovation? I know you've spoken about this a little bit for battery as a service, but if you can, you know, maybe shed some more light on, you innovate something and then you have to build that trust with the audience saying, my AI PC is not a gimmick. My partnership with the camera really does give you DSLR quality, you know? So I guess we'll start with you, Mayang. So building that trust while keeping new innovations in the focus. So I think uh, it a brand speaking out, oh, I am this, cannot deliver this. It is about the consumers we have to do. And I, hence, I think the KOL uh, brings a lot of weightages there. And when I say KOL, these are like people who are actual consumers. We have almost thousands of people who have who are part of our KOL community and they are actual consumers. We send them phone, we tell them scenarios where they can go and capture images. Similarly, for the people who are actually gamers and we say, okay, you are from gaming community, you please play games and put it on your own social media. So that's how I think we channelize that particular thing and that's how innovations come into. Any, see, innovations in something which keeps on happening every day, everything, and we don't we call them innovations, but are they actually innovations? For me, I think AI is one thing which has changed the world post the smartphones now. But in the AI ecosystem, the way AI is being used for innovations, it's a challenge. Lot of fake things happening, lot of fake communications happening, so that's also a responsibility which comes. So I think if you use the right channel, Put up the right sweet spot in terms of what is the innovation for the consumer, not for the brand. And if you're able to communicate that innovation in a day-to-day -day scenario, which will connect to the consumer, I think that's where the right communication and right innovation justice happens. Okay, this is innovation for the consumer, which he can relate to his day-to-day -day life. And hence, it, for him, it's an innovation. It's not an innovation for the brand. I yeah, know, I think uh, completely agree with Mayank on that one. Uh, see, I feel there's a lot of innovation for the sake of innovation, right? Um, and consumers will see through that, right? So, so, so there isn't uh, much point in stressing over <laughs> that kind of innovation, right? Uh, but I think, Samir, on the other front, um, uh, you know, when you have innovation, I think you need to be a little patient. Okay? Uh, because I think what happens is that with short-term sales being a very important goal, um, we forget to, you know, concentrate on the basics and the foundations, which, which, like my young said, you know, the three W's. What am I selling? Why will someone buy it? And who is that person, right? I think you have to get that right, yeah? Um, and then invest in that consumer education because that person will get it, right? Because see, when you launch an innovation in market, there's always some early adopters. 
there are always some people who pick up their hand and say, I've got to try this. They're not waiting for the ratings and the reviews to go up on a platform because the ratings and the reviews will then never go up if there is nobody who does it first, right? Um, so I think those early adopters need to get it. And that's why you need to get uh, your the who, why, what very, very right. Because you spend and invest on educating them, right? You invest your time in creating those evangelists who will say, why do they really need it? Because, see, especially this is true for a field like technology because it's complicated. Right. Uh, minus of those who really get technology, the others are still grappling to say, do I really need RAM this size? Do I need storage this size? They, they still haven't answered the most basic questions, right? They're like, oh, now let's go buy the latest because guess what? Not that they have a use case. The latest is going to last them five years. And guys, this is, this is our Indian consumer who's looking at value for everything. He's very clear. Paat saal chalane. Right? And, and that's why I should get the latest, not because the latest is serving a purpose. Right? Uh, that's why I think when you educate the consumer, you create a lot of those use cases which prove, and, and you know, we were doing some of this at HP with you on AI, uh, where we're actually taking to the consumer and saying, how will this help you? Because the guy's saying, after two years, he'll be like, I bought this fancy laptop, yaar. Ek din bhi use kiya, nahi isme kuch. you know? And, and what happens is he tells another 10 people, you don't really need it. And then you're like, Oh, but yeah, there was so much noise. I thought it'll help me. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no, but you didn't find what it could have done for you, right? Because you saw fancy communication, but the brand missed the fact that it needed to take some education to the customer, saying what kind of change it'll make to your life. Uh, so I think that's the investment that the brand needs to do, right? Uh, when you expect innovation to pick up. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head because uh, keeping the PC in mind, it was when you move from hard drives to SSDs, which are just faster, they were like, Haan, but wahi to chal raha hai. And you're like, no, no, but it's a little faster, right? And, and coming to cars also, I, I still think that, that what, uh, what Shivani spoke about with the old school audience with, with auto, I think it boils down to no matter how much technology is there, there's, there must be some set of audience that com completely comes to and says, Haan, but kitna deti hai, you know? And then how do you match those expectations of new age stuff, keeping this audience in mind? So I think it boils down again to the uh, brand values. What you set out to be as a brand, when MG launched in India, uh, we introduced India's first internet car, which was MG Hector. Until then, if you go back, there was not even a concept of internet car. Now, the question is, is the technology a utility benefit for you or is it a hoax? Now, I'll give you one example of a hoax era also. When NFTs came, everybody tried the NFT projects. Metaverse still came went by so or is it driving some kind of utility for you when we launched internet car in india we ensured that using voice using internet inside your car you have accessibility to entertainment your telematics data you use voice to open sunroof and do a you know utility of tech is something that you need to define when you are launching a product if it is not giving you any utility as a consumer, then it is all marketing garble. You know, it's not solving for anything for the consumer. Similar examples are there. When we introduced Gloucester with autonomous cars, it had autom autonomous level one technology. What it is solving for the customer is passive and active safety features. So every time MG tries to create a communication for its customers, how is tech solving a problem for the consumer in the auto space is the key objective, not to say that, okay, we've got great tech, but so what? So that is one analogy that we keep on, uh, you know, uh, facing. And it's also a poised challenge because if we go by a Deloitte um, survey that has recently come, while most of the tech is encapsulating the buttons of the car, but people want buttons back inside the car. Yeah. So that's our product feedback that we are working that how do we get buttons back inside the car? People don't want everything on the head unit. So again, going back to tech is solving a problem. Is innovation really an innovation to benefit a consumer problem? And how are you proactively listening back to the problems that the customer has to build your next set of products uh, is something that we can solve for. 
Absolutely. And um, those were all the questions that I had. But uh, before we end, I just wanted to say, you know, Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think all the three brands out here have created products which are genuinely magical. And uh, I can promise you that if you go back even a decade and show this to someone and say this is what's going to be there in 2024, they will all be shocked and stunned from uh, internet enabled cars to phones that flip and fold and don't break to a laptop that, you know, could be Jarvis next year from Iron Man. So thank you so much to the panel for having us and back to you guys in time.